Understanding is, you know, my, my continual statement for years, I saw something a long time ago, may, I don't even know, maybe 40 years ago. Because my prayer, the first prayer that I remember praying when I was enlightened, born again, filled with the Spirit, was that God would give me an understanding heart that I might know why people do what they do so that I could be part of the answer, not just part of the problem. I figured, I, I just thought if I really knew why somebody did what they did, if I could get into the motive and what what spurred the action, I could understand them better and be less likely to just react carnally. Now, I wasn't, believe me, I was not smart enough to figure this out. This was strictly a motivation from the Holy Ghost. It's one of those godly inspired prayers that you begin to speak and talk about that you have no idea the, the operation of God and the leading of the Spirit and giving you that so that you'll begin to pray it so he can begin to give it to you in your life. Understanding doesn't come overnight. You know, you can gain knowledge overnight. You can have an experience overnight. Understanding takes some time. And you've got to be willing to actually look at something and camp out on it and give the Holy Spirit time to start feeding you what you need to see the why and the wherefore. So this is such a critical thing because the prophet says in the Old Testament, I think it's Jeremiah, maybe even Isaiah too, says in a couple, maybe even Ezekiel, he says, God will give you shepherds after his own heart that will feed you with understanding. And what I came to realize years ago was anything apart from understanding will not last. (laughs) Anything that touches my life, knowledge, revelation, move of God, power, healing, deliverance, anything that I experience, that I see, that I learn, if I don't have understanding to what I've seen, what I've experienced, what I've learned, if I don't have understanding, that won't last. It will not last in my life. And that's why so many people, and I've, you know, you can imagine, I mean, I've been at this now full time and in, in, many, many different denominations, every Christian TV program at one time that existed in this nation, every network, all the talk shows, all the Christian TVs, the Jim Bakers, the, you know, Lesser Summerall's, the Jimmy Swag, all, all these things. And for the most part, I wasn't communing with men of God who had an understanding to the scripture as it applied and as it related to life and to experience and to practice. Now that may sound, oh, well, yeah, they, you know, these are scholars. These are, I didn't say they didn't know or have an intelligence toward. I'm saying they didn't understand it because these same people that I'm sitting down with either on a TV show or having dinner or at some kind of banquet or something. These are the same people that would never have a cup of coffee with a sinner. They felt totally uncomfortable and, and, and unable to relate to sinners. The majority of the people that they related with were church people. And how many of you know, 
we're all church people, right? That church people all have the same problems. And how do you deal with the problems in the church? You give people scriptures. Right? You show people just like what you just did. Oh, well, the scripture says, the scripture says, yeah, we've all learned what the scripture has to say about the flesh and the spirit. If you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the deeds of the flesh. Yeah, we all know that. That's the Galatians principle. Sure, we know that. How's that really working in your life? Because sin is pleasurable. And anything that brings you pleasure and comfort is not something that you will likely judge as harmful. And, and of course, the scientists and the and the researchers will say, "Well, uh, what is that? Uh, endorphins? What is that? They create pleasure. What is that chemical that's released? Dope, huh? Dopamine. dopamine. Once that dopamine starts being released in your little brain, <clears throat> it gives you pleasure and comfort. Well, who's going to move away from that?" <laughs> That's where it says, pick up your cross. What's the cross for? Well, it's to beat you in the head so the dopamine goes away. <laughs> All right. So my question was, uh, <clears throat> so my statement is, anything that we really don't have understanding to will not last in your life. It won't, it won't deliver you. You know how many people I've seen delivered from demons? And whether it's smoking or drugs, sex, alcohol, anger, murder, hatred, I mean, all kinds of demons coming off of people. You know, Joe and I cut our teeth in Derek Prince's ministry. And Derek Prince and Don Basham actually fathered the deliverance movement worldwide. That that ministry was covered up and dead. That was not an active ministry. Even, even, even in the turn of the century when, when the uh, move of the spirit happened in Topeka, Kansas, and they started speaking in tongues, and, and then you have the advent of the uh, Assembly of God Church and other, other churches that were basically, you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit churches. And then toward the 50s, you had the charismatic movement with, People like Amy Semple McPherson and Catherine Coleman and just a host of others with the laying on of hands and the gifts of healing and all of that happened. Well, we we saw that, but all, in all of that movement and then the great charismatic renewal in the 70s went for a decade, 70s to the 80s, the deliverance ministry was just very much in the background. Nobody was really anointed to deal with demonic strongholds in people's lives. And Derek Prince and Don Basham unearthed it and brought it into the light and brought it to the body of Christ and it became a worldwide renewal, ministry renewal was the deliverance ministry. And then you, in the 80s, you had more kooks doing it than I would say than God called anointed people. They were messing with demons and there was, it went off. Yeah. But, but the fact of the matter is, you know, that ministry was, so we cut our teeth on that. So, you know, I've experienced and seen and witnessed multitudes of people get delivered from demons. But guess what? Never, the change didn't last. Because they never had understanding to what caused it in the first place. Yeah. And the only thing the church was giving them or that the ministry was giving them was, well, you got to fill the house with the word of God. Well, that's true, but how do I do that? You walk in the word. Mm -hmm. Studying the word and memorizing the word and having an intelligence to what the Bible says will never free you from anything. 
What it does is it puts you into a false, happy state. Uh, what was that? What was that movie? Uh, no, the movie with uh, the comedian guy that Truman Show. That's all it does. Religion puts you in the Truman Show. You live in the nice house. You got the nice wife. You got the nice job. You got the nice dog. You know, everything's nice. But then you have your life, you know, where you go to work, you know, then it's Joe and the volcano going to work. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's so dramatically different that you would think that individual would go, what in the hell is wrong with me? I got to pick one or the other. I either got to live in the Truman Show or I got to live in Joe and the Volcano. What am I going to do? But they don't make that choice. They continue to go to the Truman Show on Sunday and live in Joe and the Volcano the rest of the week. Yeah. Yeah. If you haven't seen the movies, I guess you're lost listening to this. But <laughs> So, and that's why, what does Proverbs say? With all you're getting, get what? Understanding. It says understanding is the principal thing. Yeah. Oh, we we read that somewhere. Okay, so this little seven minute message that we listened to, um, when I talked about going back to when you were first enlightened and when you, I was talking about, you know, when you were filled with the Holy Spirit and, you know, baptizing the Holy Spirit, if, if you were, but then there are many people that haven't baptized the Holy Spirit, but they didn't what? Maintain it. They didn't maintain it. And so quite frankly, how many of us, well, it's been our case in many cases. Yeah. You all fill with the Holy Spirit, speak in other tongues. You've witnessed miracles. You've witnessed healings. You've witnessed deliverances in some of you in your own life. And yet you fall back. How does that happen? Why does that happen? So I realized that the word that came to me was continue in. Mm -hmm. Continue in. So I just looked up a few scriptures. So I'm just going to give you a few scriptures in relation to this. But I asked a question when we were worshiping. I said, how do you judge your walk? How do you judge your faith? Okay. Okay. And then I said, how do you judge other people's faith and other people's walk? Well, how many of you would say that it's easier to judge other people than it is yourself? For the most part, it is. It doesn't mean our judgment is necessarily right. But it is easier to judge others than it is to judge ourselves. So I felt like I needed to tell you how I judge my faith and how I judge my walk. I judge today's faith by yesterday's enlightenment. Mm 